What I want to do this morning is start off this three-day adventure with forcing you to think. Thinking takes energy. Thinking is sometimes not what we want to do, but I'm going to make you think. So the reason I put still in there, why are we still fat, is this epidemic is not news. You know, it's been around for at least 30 years. Um, Jim has been working on this since the 70s, myself since the 80s. So it's been around for quite a while, and literally, we still haven't solved the problem. So the question is, <clears throat> we have a ton of good science that talks about <clears throat> you know, what's wrong or what's not wrong with the body, um, but it hasn't done any, any good. We're still fat. And so I would propose to you, I'm going to give you the answer, and then we're going to talk about it for the next 40 minutes or so. <clears throat> the answer is because I don't think we have a good enough reason to not be fat. Yeah. Hmm. So you'll see what I mean when we start going through some of this because this is not only a complex problem, but it's an incredibly more difficult problem than most of the other behavior changes that we talk about, whether it be tobacco cessation or things of that nature, brushing your teeth as a habit, blah, blah, blah. This is way more difficult, in part because of the evolutionary biology behind how we're constructed. What is the blueprint for the human body? And what background did it develop on? When I talk about background, I mean, what, is it, what were the conditions under which our physiology developed to ensure survival? So <coughs> there have been at least 82 putative causes <laughs> proposed <laughs> for obesity. <coughs> and I'm sure every day somebody adds a new one. Um, and, you know, there's probably a lot of these that have something to do with the environment in which we live that may contribute in some way, shape, or form, but it doesn't get us any closer to what do we do about it, right? So, you know, <coughs> st stair design, okay? Stairs are in the back of the building, locked, fire codes, et cetera. We can open the stairs up and make them non-fire code dependent, et cetera, et cetera. Does that mean people are going to take the stairs? Don't know. So, anyway, so there's a ton of different things and people are always looking for, well, there must be one thing we can do to get rid of this problem. It's such a pesky nuisance. One thing. Well, I got news. Probably not going to be one thing. Can I ask you a question? Was that yeah. in order of, of importance? No. Or, oh, okay. Just 82 oh, things. Okay. Take your <laughs> <thing. laughs> You got them all down. Okay. Yep. <laughs> write, write them down. Those can be That's right. Exactly. Uh, Number 48. Yes. Yeah. Screenshot. <laughs> so, and Jim showed you a slide like this last night, which is, yes, if you work backwards from obesity, you have to be in energy imbalance in order to get to obese state in the first place. So how much you eat has to be more than how much you burn. And there's all kinds of things that lead to those different conditions. You know, food is cheap and available and accessible everywhere, and basically technology has taken over our lives, and you literally don't have to move anymore to survive. You can sit on the couch all day long, call up Amazon, have stuff delivered. You never have to go anywhere. So what I want to do is sort of go a step beyond that. I want to talk about, first of all, what is that evolutionary blueprint? And what's the relevance? And then talk about the environment and society and you. It's like, where do we need to go so that we find a force that's as strong as the biology to overcome all of these things that are causing us to sit still and eat too much. So why we are the way we are? This is the summary slide. We're hardwired to like sugar, fat, and salt. Go figure. All those nasty, bad foods that we want to get rid of are high in sugar, salt, and fat. It's not an accident. Those are the things that our bodies were preferred or designed to prefer because that's where the energy in the environment was. Salt happened to be a very rare thing once upon a time. And it's essential for survival. So now it's, it's everywhere, and we have too much of it. Humans evolved under conditions in which physical activity pulls appetite. Jim showed you that slide last night, which said, below a certain level of physical activity, the system doesn't know what to do, right? So you overeat and you overconsume and you get obese. As soon as you get above that level of activity, your appetite and your physical activity are pretty well in sync. So if you're a marathon runner, you've got to eat to provide all that energy. And, um, but marathon runners typically don't get obese. Humans are energy misers. What I mean by that? That means that we don't spend energy unless we absolutely have to. 
and that includes cognitive energy. The brain takes a lot of the blood supply, 20% of your blood flow. It's required to keep the brain alive. And thought is expensive. So we like to make heuristics, little things that do the decisions that are things that we figured out are good for survival. We just put them in the little heuristic and we just keep doing them because that's the easy thing to do. I don't have to think about it anymore, right? So those are all things that we have to wrestle against. The biology is not broken. We've been looking for years for something broken with the biology, that we can get a pill and we can fix that biology. The biology is working perfectly. It was just never designed to be in the environment that we have today. So you put this biology into the current environment, what do you have? You've got energy dense, high calorie food is everywhere, and it's really inexpensive. Again, not an accident. It's by design. We no longer need to be physically active to survive. Wow. A couple of thousand years ago, if people, they only dreamed about having a lifestyle where they didn't have to work so blooming hard, right? Cultural values and practices developed in a different survival context. Look at all the cultural practices that we use to celebrate important events. We eat. We rest. We do all those things that were really rare in our history, um, and those are part of the culture. And now we're saying, whoa, bad idea. Well, it takes a while to undo culture. Not that it can't be done, but that's, again, what we're facing. So we're not only facing the biological struggle, but we've sort of put a culture in place that says that the things that lead to obesity are really what we celebrate. Not intentionally, but that's the way it started out. So this is the situation we have. This is my model of the world. Godzilla meets Bambi. So on the left-hand side, you've got the biology, sugar, fat, salt, rest, and joy. And then over here, we have what we're trying to do to overcome that biology. And I'm not being flippant here. I'm just saying we're, we're trying to do things to fight against that. And I say it's wholly insufficient. This is the world's shortest movie. I actually saw this movie once, Godzilla vs. <laughs> Bambi. And it was about 30 seconds long, and Bambi lost. <laughs> so part of what I was saying before is that we're hardwired toward action. We're biased toward action, not thought. Thought is expensive. We like to save our big thinking brains for adaptation. So if you find yourself in the middle of the Arctic, and holy cow, you're using all of your big brain to figure out how to survive. I tell people, if they woke up in a different city every morning, in a different hotel, strange place, you would spend the rest of the day figuring out where am I, how do I get something to eat, how do I get back home. <clears throat> that is what your big brain was designed to do. All the little stuff, when you're in one place and you've been living there for 20 years and everything's routine, you don't need to use that big brain. So we spend most of our time over here in reactive and deliberative, automatic behaviors. This is just something that I know works because I've done it a thousand times and it seemed to meet my needs. So I'm not going to even think about it anymore. It's subconscious. And then over here, this is where all the problem solving comes. This is where we need the big brain. Well, we don't really use that very often because that is expensive. So that's all contributing to this problem where we tend to react in the moment. The biology of choice, we choose for the moment. You've heard about hyperbolic discounting? The further into the future, the benefit is, the less you pay attention to it today. What are we talking about here? Well, it feels pretty good to sit on the couch and eat the hot fudge sundae today. It doesn't feel quite as good today to go out and run 10 miles, right? So. Basically, there's no choice when you're talking about in the moment. There's really no contest. It's like, I'm going to sit on the couch and eat the hot fudge sundae because it feels good right now. So, and I'm not saying that these can't be overcome. I'm just saying this is really hard stuff. And the marketplace plays to the biology. This is our world. Get it now, pay for it later. It's true of everything, right? You buy a couch, 90 days, same as cash. Have it, you know, no, no payments till next year, blah, blah, blah. You know, no consequences until way out there. Mm -hmm. So we live now and we pay later. So this is exactly the same thing with obesity. 
obesity is the sort of thing that, yes, it's risk factor for chronic disease and all these sorts of things, but those are way out there. I'll worry about that tomorrow. I'm worried about today, today. So, back to our summary. We're hardwired to like sugar, salt, and fat. We evolved under conditions in which physical activity pulls appetite. We're energy misers, and the biology isn't broken. We built the environment to serve the biology. It is no accident that all these things we talked about in the environment are prevalent everywhere. Cheap, inexpensive food with high calories, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all things by design. We only dreamt of having such a good life from an evolutionary perspective. And now we've got it, we're kind of going, ooh, maybe we went too far. So our biology applies constant pressure to eat too much. Basically, it's always asking you, if there's food available, do you want to eat something? And it's there 24-7. It never gets turned off. It's always looking to make sure that you have adequate food for survival. So it is not something that occurs periodically. It is pressure always there. And we have food everywhere. That's why when you walk by the administrative assistance desk and there's a big bowl of jelly beans or something, you just <laughs> reach in and you grab one. Right? Or you grab two. Or you grab a handful. Um, so that is part of what the evolutionary biology is constantly pressuring you to do. So what about taste? What about things like sugar? So it turns out sugar, sweet taste, is the only thing that's inborn in infants, a preference for sugar. So if infants prefer sucrose over less sweet lactose. So the infant on the, on the left, sweet, yay. Sour, not so much, bitter, yuck. So right from birth, we're programmed to like sweet. And it turns out it's not, again, it's not an accident. Foods taste good because they are energy dense. It's not just that energy dense foods taste good. It's foods taste good because they're energy dense. That's how the biology develops. <coughs> and preference for fat develops in the first two years of life. So you end up with these appetites that are very very much kind of primordial that are present from a very early age. And, you know, by the time we get to our age, we're trying to say, how do I turn this off? So the economics of food choice, half of the energy in the U.S. is provided by added sugars and fat. Again, no mistake. No, you know, it's not a conspiracy. It wasn't aliens that did it. We built the environment this way because that's what our body said. If I could have more of that, it's a good thing. So energy dense foods provide more energy per unit volume and more energy per dollar. You can get a whole lot more calories in you know, a glob of fill in the blank candy bar than you can in a big bunch of broccoli. And the cost. We worked hard to make these desired things the cheapest possible. So on the left-hand side, you've got energy density. The higher up, the more energy dense. Oil is at the top. The bottom, you've got energy cost per calorie. Raspberries, probably the most expensive thing you, you can buy to get calories. So the things that we're telling people to avoid are all the things over there on the left-hand side. The, things that the prudent choices are all over here on the right-hand side. So I'm not saying there's no way to eat healthfully for a small amount of money. I'm just saying that the way that the environment has evolved was really designed to fill these preferences over here. And move too little. Yes, so I read about a guy who literally, he <coughs> lived in an apartment in Seattle and he, for a year. The experiment was, can he survive in the apartment without leaving for a year? He ordered everything online, it got delivered to his door, he never left the apartment. Food, shelter, everything right there, done. It's like, wow, is that the kind of lifestyle we really want? <laughs> you know, isn't that really cool? Maybe not. <laughs> so, so we know that leisure time physical activity, which is what everybody looks at and says, ah, this has nothing to do with physical activity, it's all about food. Because they're looking at leisure time physical activity. It hasn't changed in the past 30 years. And we keep getting fatter. What's going on? Well, people haven't looked as carefully until recently at physical activity declining at work, physical activity declining at home, 
all of the activities of daily living, you just think about it. How many places has technology stepped in to pick up the slack? You got a, a Zumba, a Roomba thingy that runs around back into the floor. You can <laughs> sit there and watch it, right? I mean, everything. You got garage door openers. You got, you know, milkshake makers, things that you, you don't have to do anything anymore. It's all electrified. So this is the slide that Jim showed last night, which shows you that, you know, below a certain level of physical activity, your body literally has no idea what to do. There's no intrinsic biology that can say, all right, I got this, right? As soon as you get a little bit more active, now you're giving the biology a shot, right? to match appetite and energy expenditure. So, famous story of the Amish. They reject technology, they plow the fields by hand, they live an agrarian lifestyle that's much like the turn of the last century, 1900, roughly, for a lot of people in this country. And the men get about 18,000 steps per day if you put a pedometer on them, the women about 14,000, compared to the US average, and we did a Harris poll some years ago, looking at the national average steps, is somewhere in the 5,000 to 6,000 range, okay? And the difference between those two, the Amish and the average American, is about six, five to 600 calories a day. That's a lot. And if you look at the obesity rate in these populations, zero in men, 9% in women, compared to the U.S. averages. Now, I'm not saying we all adopt the Amish lifestyle, but at the same time, it makes the point that the biology that we inherited was working perfectly back about 100 years ago, largely because these people had to work pretty darn hard to make ends meet. So the evolving workforce. So service jobs are going up. And what does that mean? That means we're doing less and less labor. So goods producing jobs are going down, agricultural jobs are going down, and the total amount of change of energy there for daily occupational work, uh, caloric expenditure, is 150 calories a day, roughly, for men and for women. So our calorie expenditure at work is going down because we don't have to move around anymore. Trends in household energy expenditure. Now these are cake house per week, so divide that by seven. So women, lots of work still. Men, Increasing, yes, men coming up in the world, uh, but still it's a big decline over the past 40 years or so. So I'm going to show you a little video. It's kind of fun. If I can figure out how to get this to work. Whoops. Go back. Can you? I turn sound way up. In the workplace today, there is a silent killer. <laughs> it is one of ten major causes of disability. It is utilized more than anything else in your office. It increases your chances of contracting over 25 chronic diseases. Every person in your office is at risk. It is a leading cause of diabetes, cancer, and heart disease. You are probably using one right now. <laughs> So that's just designed to make the point that in addition to physical activity going down, sedentariness is going up. Now, don't ask me how to explain the mechanism, but it's actually been defined as an independent risk factor over and above low physical activity. So sitting has unique metabolic features that basically aren't good. <laughs> and if you look at the US, this is in met hours per week, which just means multiples of your metabolism uh, is, is a met. Um, so if you look at average met hours per week, I want you to take a look at the absolute number for the US, okay? So back in 65, it was just a little above 200, right? Now we're down to about 100 over the course of the last whatever. So this is, this is a, a line that, where the data that they looked at stopped, and then they're projecting out to 2030. Um, but 
the point is that sedentary behavior is going up and pretty much all these other components of activity are going down. And this is worldwide. So here's the UK. This is China. Look at the dramatic drop in the last 10 years in China. So they're not immune. This is Brazil, steadily down. And I want to go back to China for a second. I want to take a look at the absolute number. So remember, the US was here back in 65, and we're now, we're now, we're down to here, 100. So China's not, you know, China's still better than we are, but they're going down fast. Brazil, same story. India, same story. So, and it's a function of technology. It's a function of transportation systems. And all the modern conveniences that we take for granted are changing the way people live their lives everywhere around the globe. Now, sure, there are places where people still struggle to survive. They don't have flush toilets and they have to walk to the local river to get water. That's a fairly smaller proportion of the US population now. I think the latest results show that for the first time in human history, about half the people on the planet are overweight or obese, equal to the number of people that are undernourished. So we're sitting too much, and it's lethal. So this is a study of an epidemiologic study of 126,000, 123,000 Americans that said the overall, um, if they spent six or more hours per day of their leisure time sitting, they had a death rate that was 20% higher than people who sat for three hours or less. For women, it was 40% higher. You're going to hear more about that from Dr. Levine tomorrow, I believe. So if you look at inactivity and life expectancy, this is from uh, an, a JAMA paper that wasn't published too long ago. Um, basically, if you just look at the mortality expected, uh, or life expectancy, the universe of mortality for, for inactivity, and it's profound. I mean, it can be more than a year of your life is taken away from being too sedentary. So what? It's always the question. So what? So what does this suggest about ways we might approach the problem differently? So we have this very tough evolutionary biology that's sort of dictating how the body wants to work. And we have an environment that is built to meet all of the, the wildest desires that our physiology ever had. So what do we do about it? Well, this is a social ecological diagram that we put together over 10 years ago now, which is looking at kind of the complexity of this problem. And if you needed to go in and modify every behavior setting where you could do something wrong, make a bad choice, this is what you're looking at. So here in the center, you've got the individual characteristics of the person, so the yellow and the, and the orange and the pink. You've got this lifestyle line, which is the way the individual interfaces with the environment. And then you have all these places where you lead your life. And then the factors which shape what goes into those places, and the factors that shape what goes into those places. And finally, you have the whole thing sitting in this 24-7 media environment that we have, where if somebody gets um, injured in Pakistan, we hear about it the same day. Never used to be that way. So we are, we are so connected. So this is one way to approach it, is to take them on one at a time and say, all right, we're going to change each and every one of those settings where people live their lives and make it difficult for you to do the wrong thing. That's an approach. And I think we may need some of that. But it's pretty daunting. I think we think, need to think about the problem in a new way. Yes, I think we're going to need some new policies and environmental interventions. But at the end of the day, back to the stair example, people still need to comply. You can have sidewalks and stairs everywhere, but most people are using them. It's not doing anybody any good. So what is the motivational structure that works in the modern world? How do healthier behaviors become part of daily life, even if they take cognitive and physical effort? Just the things we don't want to do, think and move. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So I think we need to work with the biology. We've been trying to fight the biology. How do we work with the biology? Our biology is first and foremost concerned with survival. 
So what are key elements of survival in the 21st century? You can easily imagine survival a couple hundred years ago, what that looked like. Well, what does it look like today? Where do you get food, shelter, safety? I'm not going to talk about reproduction, but food, shelter, safety down there with reproduction as essential elements of survival. Where do the means come from to acquire these? You get them in the mail? No. You have a job. You have employment. You're paid to do something. And that's what gives you the means by which you can have an apartment, buy food, ensure your safety to the best of your ability, etc. So it's really about economic growth and prosperity. That's the engine which provides the means <coughs> by which people survive. The economy provides the jobs. People have jobs. They have a reason to you know, exist. Um, and I'm not saying it's the be-all, end-all, but it's a pretty powerful motivator. You get up in the morning, you go, ah, I don't feel like working. Then you don't feel like working the next day, and the next day, then what happens? Well, you don't get paid anymore. And then what do you do? Right? So I think survival in the 21st century is about having employment. So what's the real problem here? We got all these environmental problems that we talked about. The real problem is there's no compelling reason to change. Why? We don't have a good enough reason to not be fat. Is it diabetes and hypertension, early death, the reason? That is a fantastic reason, but as I said earlier, hyperbolic discounting means humans don't worry about that in the moment. They're making the decision to eat the hot fudge sundae right now, and they know that a hot fudge sundae is not good for them. And they know that they might die early, or they might get heart disease, or their dad died of a heart attack at age 40, or whatever. And they still don't do it, because it's not immediate enough. The hot fudge sundae is an immediate reward right now. So it's a great point, and I think that's part of what we're going to talk about. You, you projected my next slide, which is... <laughs> <laughs> and I put this in the context of the workplace, because I do a lot of work in workplaces, and you know, the wellness programs and all the goody stuff comes out of HR, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I gotta tell you, I love HR people, but it's not where people go for either innovation or to get attaboys and attagirls. They're usually the people that hire and fire and do all the other stuff. So, you know, what are the incentives that we get today for doing the right thing? It usually comes via the healthcare system. Premium reduction, online exercises, all these things they want you to do and you get 200 bucks off, right? Take a quiz on the, online and, and you've done your job and you get $40 off your next premium. Well, and I'm not saying this is bad, I'm just saying how present are these in your daily life? So I'd say healthcare as a slice of daily life is a very small proportion. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, hey, what am I gonna do to interact with the healthcare system today? <laughs> no, they, they, they get ready for work, they get kids off to school, you know, they, they're living their life in the moment. So you got all these other things going on, and yeah, and then you have a cow when you get your bill at you know, the end of the month or the end of the year that says, holy smokes, look at my healthcare costs. Well, it's too late then. So I think we have to drive motivation for behavior change by linking the desired behaviors to basic needs. So right now, change is all about self-actualization. It's got to come from within, and you've got to want to do it for your own reasons. And what, 20, 30% of the people seem to be able to do that? And then there's everybody else. And everybody else isn't there yet. So what if we started to look at the bottom of the pyramid and said, what if the motivation for this came from, literally, survival, having a job? And if you look at that on a societal level, you're looking at this kind of a pyramid where basically at the bottom of the pyramid, survival for a healthy society is about economic health, jobs, global competitiveness, education. It's about all that stuff that provides the means by which we can all have healthy, productive lives, right? That's all linked to what we're talking about here. So strategies for change, going back to that Circle diagram, you can either try to structure each behavior environment individually. Perfectly viable option, but very difficult because there's many of them. And yes, you need policies, regulations, choice architecture, which Brian Wansink will talk more about. That's behavioral economics. Um, great strategies, but 
they're not global enough, any one of them, to make the kind of change happen that we need to get. Continue to focus on individual motivation. Change must come from within, yes, absolutely. But it doesn't have to be motivation to be super healthy and not get disease. It could be motivation to stay employed. It could be a different type of motivation. So I'd say leverage a collective motivation across society that's consistent with today's priorities and values. We tend to ignore what's important for the country when we start talking about some of these interventions. You know, the US, I don't care whether you're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, whatever Aryan, the economic growth is something that you want because it is the means by which people stay employed. What if healthful behavior was an employment expectation? And you say, whoa, 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 privacy, private behavior, can't do that. Now, wait a minute. Every workplace I know has rules, behavior rules. There's a dress code. I can't wear a Speedo to work. Much as I'd like to, I can't do it, <laughs> right? There's a dress code, right? So there's a secrecy code. You're not supposed to be telling everybody what the secrets of your company are, or whatever they are. There's usually harassment code. There is a, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, privacy for, for secrets code. There's all kinds of codes. Uh, when I worked at P&G, we had a book this thick called the Business Conduct Code. And it was more behavior codes than you can even shake a stick at. And you signed off on that when you joined the company. You said, I'm agreeing to adhere to these codes, and if I don't, I get fired. Well, what makes these behaviors any different? Especially now that we're all in one big pool, this big collective healthcare pot. So if I sit on the couch and eat Cheetos all day and don't do a darn thing, and you're out running 10 miles and eating fruits and vegetables, terrific. You're paying for my bad behavior. So we're all joined by the healthcare system, too. So basically, I'd say there's no reason why we can't expect people to behave healthfully at work. We can set up workplaces that have rules that say, no, you work here, this is what we do. You don't have to work here, but if you work here, this is what we do. So I think that plants the seeds to create demand for a healthier environment. If every parent who is employed was expected to do certain things while in the workplace, I guarantee you they'll be looking for opportunities to adhere to that outside of the workplace. Maybe not 100%, but they're going to make some improvements. If kids were getting this kind of uh, treatment in schools where it's about learning, why do kids need to eat well and move more? Because it's good for learning. Why do you need this in the workplace? Because it's good for productivity. Every boss will tell you that they'd rather have, you know, the, the biggest cost they have are people that are out sick, you know, they're on workers comp or whatever. If you had a healthier workforce, you're more productive and you're saving costs there in addition to high re higher retention, better recruitment. So there's a lot of reasons to do it. That's exactly why I can't wear a Speedo to work because <coughs> it's not good for the business. So we need a better reason for people to be healthy that matters to them as individuals and the nation as a whole. It's got to be a what's in it for me and what's in it for us. Work with the biology. We need to reward immediate. We have to have rewards that are immediate and part of daily life, something that shows up every day in your life. Align individual and collective purpose. Right now, we have misalignment between the whole system, and you're being expected to do things that there's no other thing in the environment that's basically aligned with those incentives, those motives. So if somebody doesn't do things to lower their blood pressure, they'd be fired? No. No, I think you need to create the environment in the workplace that expects people to, I can't grade you on your genes, I can't grade you, you can't choose your parents, so there are certain things that are out of your control, but if everybody from the CEO on down is moving more in the workplace and the, the food codes in the workplace basically say that everybody eats well when they're at work, then I, it, I don't care what your cholesterol is. That's a side effect. Well. How, do you, how would you track people with this? It's behavior. I know, but how, how you, would you know whether one person was doing it and the other one wasn't? Well, that's, think about the workplace. Does your boss know what you're doing? No. <laughs> 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 no, he really does. No, not, a, not well, throughout the day, no. Well, we can talk about the details of it, which include part of the employment evaluation, your yearly evaluation, whatever we would actually have. Um, goals that you're setting for yourself to improve health and wellness behaviors. 
Again, it's not about your cholesterol level. That is a side effect of your behaviors, in some cases of your genes. So I'm not going to bridge on that. Just like your BMI. It just feels like an inappropriate intrusion into your personal <laughs> life by work. And not, not only that, but I think there's also perception by many people that when their companies are promoting a, a more fit lifestyle, it's not because the world needs to be healthier. It's because if you're healthier, you'll have to take fewer sick days, and the company will benefit from that. But what's wrong and with the cost that? of their insurance will go down. Right. So and, there's, but, and what's wrong with that? I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate for a minute. If I'm a company, that's what I want, lower insurance costs and more productive employees. And again, I think the details are, the, the devil is in the details, but conceptually, is why, why is that not okay for a company? Well, it's, it's because a because you want me to enjoy myself less, I can relax more, I can eat more candy, but you want me to enjoy myself less, and maybe, it's, maybe I'm painting it in a very small way, but you know, for your benefit as the boss, and the money goes into your pocket. Why is it any different? Why is it any different than a dress code? Well, I, it actually scares me more, much beyond what you're talking about. If this policy begins like this, who says that the woman who has six miscarriages and costs the company a lot of money or has two premature children, they tell her she can't have any more children? No. I mean, how do you stop the intrusion into the medical? Well, maybe it would help if we had some people some actual examples, like at our workplace, they got us standing desks, which I didn't like, I kind of appreciate that. I don't have to use the standing desk, I can sit if I want to, but um, I have the option of using the standing desk. I think that's a great thing for the company to do, and if that encourages, you know, like lots of people to use the standing desk, I think that's great. Um, I mean, is it stuff like that that you're talking about? Can you give us some more specific examples of what it looks like in the workplace? Well, you are saying to make it mandatory though, right? You're so saying this would be vulnerative. You create an expectation in the workplace, just like business conduct codes for other things, that if you work here, this is what we do. So we have every opportunity to, to move. So it's not, you're not looked down upon if you go take a walk at lunch by your boss who now says, where is Sally? Why isn't she at her desk? Right? That's the way the workplace is structured right now. It's a 1950s mentality. The only thing that really matters in the workplace to the boss is productivity, what comes out of the end of the pipe. I don't care if you're wearing your PJs at home doing the work, as long as the work gets done. So there, there are certain expectations that you create, um, and including, I want you to pick three wellness goals or three self-improvement goals for the year about how you're going to become, you know, how you're going to treat yourself better. I'm going to give you permission and expectation. The, the reason right now is we don't have, first of all, we don't give people permission, right? And certainly, it's not an expectation. So we, get, we tell them they've got to go to do all the self-improvement, and you've got to do it on your own time. Right? We're working here. You go home, figure out how to get healthy at home. It costs me too much money. Well, that's not very empowering to people. It doesn't really say my boss or my business cares about me. If it's expected of everybody, from the CEO on down, it's just part of business conduct. This is the way we do it. This is, we find that this is a more productive environment for everybody and people are happier and they're healthier and, you know, terrific. So I think this is the, this is the only way I think we're going to make significant change is to start to build, and maybe this isn't the right solution, but we got to find a motivator that is so present in your life that we can attach to that people will change their behavior. If it's just up to them, it probably isn't going to happen. I feel like there isn't enough discussion around the, the responsibilities of employers mm -hmm. to help individuals meet these goals. So I think it would be more effective if there was a policy that made it compulsory to increase the amount of vacation time, uh, mm -hmm. that everyone has a health spending account in addition to their insurance. Everyone has you know, 500 bucks a year to spend on uh, health classes or workout gear, or, you know, things like that. I think that would be a more constructive way to go about it and, and achieve those results. Yeah. I'd say it's an and. Say that too because I think there are a couple agencies in the federal government that actually, you, I have friends that work in the Department of Defense or whatever, and they'll get paid for an hour or two a week if they go to the gym. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, that money's gone. So it's kind of an extra pot of money. We get like, extra vacation days if we do that. Right. Well, you get extra vacation days. Or it's something that the company is taking on as well. We're getting a benefit, so we're going to pass some of that benefit on to you. 
um, and then it benefits both. Well, I told you this wasn't going to be a talk that puts you to sleep. So the point is, you're thinking, which is good. That's my purpose here today is to get you to think. And I'm just giving you some ideas about what can drive change. And you may not like it, but this is an idea. And we're actually working with work sites to try some of these things out. You know, we got a lot of people who are interested because they said, we've been at this for 15 or 20 years. We've done every single thing we can think of, and nothing moves the needle. What else you got for me? And so they get it when you describe it this way. They understand it. Now, how everybody receives it, I think it depends on how you roll it out. You know, this is not punishment. It's reward. Yeah, it's... So, I think what we're looking at is kind of the dawn of a new, of a new thinking space, a new age, where we can create some new ideas to go test. So, there's this polarity that's out there in the discussion that says, all right, get people over here, say, just leave everybody alone, right? Leave them alone. Let them do their own thing. And you got people over here that says, oh, no, we got a tax and mandate and control and everything. Like, there's some blend of all that that's probably the right answer. I think what we don't have right now is we don't have anybody working on the demand for the healthy choices. Why do people want them? We got all kinds of people working on the access and providing. It's not like healthy food's not available. It's been available for years, right? So, you know, the people that are underserved, they're shopping at Walmart like everybody. There's plenty of stuff at Walmart that's healthy. But the point is, we don't have good enough reason for people to want to do that yet in mass. And that's all we're working on, is trying to figure out what is that big motivational push that can get more people engaged. And that's how you begin to change the culture. When more people are doing it, suddenly it becomes more of the normal thing as opposed to what's wrong with you ordering the salad. You know, you should be ordering the cheeseburger with ch chili. So it's about creating demand. Great cartoon, it's a far side cartoon. It says, dang, Zelda seems to attract all the little kids. <laughs> so where do we start? Well, you've heard my personal preference, which is workplaces. Why? Because that is directly tied to the prosperity engine. That is, at a nation, national level, important. And being a more productive, more competitive country in the global marketplace is really important for the United States of America. Um, schools and home. We've been working in schools a lot, and we're trying to do the same thing, align incentives. So in schools, you go in with a health program, and everybody says, oh, great, we have a health program. They don't do it. Why? That's not what they're paid to do. They're paid to get kids to get good test scores. Well, there's more information now showing that kids who are moving in school, who are fit, score better on standardized tests. That's the reason for getting them moving in school. You can think what you want about movement, but if it makes better learning and it makes better test scores, schools want to do it. So we developed a program called Take 10 that's really teaching curriculum objectives in the classroom using movement as a learning modality. And nobody cared for the first five years we pushed the program as a health program. As soon as there was data that showed in a longitudinal study it improved standardized test scores, it's in 55,000 classrooms across the US in four different countries. Suddenly you have a reason that's aligned with the purpose of that, of that particular context, school. So I'm not going to say any one thing's going to work. We need it all. These powerful biological forces are going to be hard to overcome. So I think we need, yes, individual inspiration. People who are ready to change, great, we can help them. Environmental structuring, where possible. We ought to have control of our schools, right? Parents ought to be the ones saying, hey, wait a minute, this is what my school environment should be. Nudge, choice architecture, where possible. Anywhere where you can basically use that behavioral economic strategy of people don't want to think, and here's their natural predilection to choose this, um, we're going to talk about that. Uh, I know Brian's going to talk about that. I've, I've got a paper I'm going to present on Wednesday about healthy defaults in restaurants um, to, to see what happens to behavior in that context. Continuing product and service innovation to make healthy behaviors more desirable. Yes, more supply. And a more important why for the average citizen. That is the demand piece that's missing today. So the takeaway, why we are the way we are, survival. We have built the environment to serve the biology. Obesity is a normal response to the environment. 
to overcome it, we're going to have to rely on cognition. We are going to have to think our way out of this problem, individually and socially. We must find a better why for people and society to change, and the why must be important for survival in the modern world. It's got to have some immediate value beyond the value out there called saving health care costs. This is a very wise man, 100 years ago about the dawn of the automobile and electricity and everything else, and they're going, oh my god, the world's going to hell. Um, but it's, uh, it's very prescient as of, uh, you know, same applies to today. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>
soon as they put it on the scorecard, stuff happened. We did that with safety, we did it with diversity, we did it with a lot of things that people didn't think they wanted at the beginning. But as soon as it was, no, we're going to do this, and you're going to get graded on it, then it happened. So I think those are things we need to explore more. But the work sites we're working with, basically that's the approach we're taking. And every one of them is different because they have a different type of business. Is it a manufacturing business? Is it a, you know, an office <coughs> business? Whatever. You have to be sensitive to the context of, of what the work is. <coughs> Can you give us examples of what they do in these places? I mean, do they have stand-up desks? Do they have time for people to take breaks? Do they give them classes? What, are, what do they do to get them healthier? All of the above. Mm -hmm. So yeah, stand-up desks. They have moving workstations. So they have like two, two treadmill workstations somewhere that can be used at any point in time for people that want to just get up and move around. Um, they have sort of policies that say, you know, there's, there's, it's open season on walking at lunch or walking meetings. We have uh, food rules, food environment rules. So we've had uh, one work site that basically <coughs> came up with this healthy potluck. So every Friday, the employees provided the food and they provided the recipes and they all had to meet certain criteria. So they got involved in how do I take grandma's recipe and turn it into something great. And we help them with stuff like recipe makeovers and things where they can look for opportunities. But it's really kind of setting the new context for the, for the environment. We've done the, um, there's two businesses we're working with that have built, built the uh, goals into their performance appraisal. Mm. So it's part of what people are expected to do because now it's, they've picked the goals. They're the ones that are now, now you've told your boss and I'm working on these and the <coughs> boss is checking in with said, how are you doing on that? And the boss has his, his or her own goals. Yeah. So what happens if they don't meet the goals? Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe uh, a about carrot versus sticks and, and well you don't get fired if you don't meet your goals but think of it but as in terms of incentives I mean yeah. you talked about um, uh, rewards and, and, and recognition mm -hmm. do they tend to take a, a more carrot approach or a stick approach or a combination or is that usually a, a more carrot point? approach yeah so one of the work sites that we had which was 22 different companies around the they, they owned a, it was a conglomerate. They had 20 different, different sites around the country. They set up um, wellness champions, and it was a volunteer thing at first. And so people at each site, there was two wellness champions at each site, and those people were basically then, by the end of the, of the first year, were sort of adored by the rest of the people. Everybody wanted to be a wellness champion because their, their name was up on the board. They were getting all the out-of-boys and out-of-girls. They, you know, they were seen as kind of the catalysts for for this change within the, the business, and everybody wanted a piece of that. So there's some recognition, that's a carrot, right? So mm -hmm. um, the people who don't meet their goals, it's just like any motivational interviewing. It's like, well, let's talk, let's talk through that. You know, what, what happened? You know, why, why didn't this or that happen? You know, and then it's back to how can the workplace better support your goals? Let's talk about what gets in the way here. Because really all you can do is you can regulate the workplace. You can say, we can make this impossible for you to not have the opportunity to be healthy, right? That's the best the workplace can do. It's still up to you, but if it's on your performance review, then in the back of people's mind, they're kind of going, well, I wonder if my promotion, you know, is, you know, if you're not, if you're not drinking the Kool-Aid, then maybe you're not in line for promotion. It's just like anything else, like at, at, at any other business, if you're the guy that wears the Speedo to work, you might be the best worker that they got. You're going to get promoted? Well, I don't think so. So it's a very subtle kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So the carrots are much bigger than the sticks, let's put it that way. Okay. Can I ask a, just a simple question? From the beginning, you were talking about um, how our brains uh, don't want to think necessarily, uh, that it's expensive. Um, can you explain a little bit more about that, the biology of that, what that is, or how that works? Because I, I don't understand that. Well, I think I was trying to make the point that we reserve the capacity, the executive decision-making capacity for adaptive needs. And obviously, when you don't need to adapt anymore, you can still use it to, for art and creativity and other things that we really never had much chance to do way back when. But at the same time, it's not... We tend to not point that in the direction of, of 
things that already have been built into heuristics that meet daily needs. So the things that you do that are now kind of rote, that are automatic, that is, is easy. It takes very little energy once you create a heuristic, a behavioral pattern, kind of like a macro, right? You take 25 keystrokes and you turn it into one to save time and energy. So, you know, I like to think about what the process of changing behavior is like creating a new trail in the jungle. So you've been going down this one path in the jungle, it's worn down to the dirt, it goes to the, the temple, the hot fudge Sunday, it's my favorite. So, um, so there, there's, you know, it's, it's easy to go to because you've done it a thousand times and the trail is clear. Now you're saying, I want to go to a different temple. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the broccoli temple or whatever it is. Then you've got to get out your machete and you've got to cut a new path, right? And then you've got to keep cutting a new path every day and you've got to keep going on that same path day in, day out until it's worn down to the dirt, while at the same time letting the old path grow over. That's the challenge to behavior change. Because there's two things now. You've got to create the new path and you have to destroy the old path. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, I'm sure some neurobiologists could probably explain it in more neurobiological terms. Yeah. Um, and then you. Uh, I have another kind of basic question. Uh, it seems like with the Godzilla of us all being surrounded by delicious um, foods and all of us sitting most of the time, um, we should all be obese. Why are we all obese? It's a great question. I think Dan may talk about some of that. So I'll save it for, for Dan, but I think you know some, some people, their, their oxidative capacity for things like fat may be a little bit greater, and maybe you're not as sedentary as you think compared to some other people. Um, so, <laughs> well, there's sedentary and then there's sedentary. <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's complicated. And I, I think basically it's either, either genetics are playing uh, the bigger role or whatever the environment is. I mean, people like, for example, Colorado has been the skinniest state for a long time. Was well, that because there's something unique about Colorado? Probably attracts a particular kind of people that want an active lifestyle. They want to, you know, be hiking in the mountains and doing all kinds of stuff that other people wouldn't enjoy. And because of doing all that, that's really helping them maintain a, a leaner physique. A question here. Yeah, I was wondering, um, speaking of challenge, um, if you could, uh, if you have any thoughts on the, uh, the federal government's effort to um, combat obesity, especially among children, but the incredible pushback that schools are giving the federal government with this whole healthy school lunch and the controversy surrounding a lot of school districts not wanting to even participate in that because the kids aren't, are, are throwing that kind of food away. I mean, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, on that particular endeavor that they're... Well, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one, one thing that's, there's two parts to me. One is money. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I've seen some beautiful experiments done where the whole cafeteria has been converted into healthy food. The kids were involved in the choice of the healthy food. So it was not somebody saying, here, eat this. It was them saying, here are your choices. You give them five healthy things to choose from. They pick it. Now they want to eat it because they picked it. Um, the reason that and that was actually cost neutral. More food went in the kids, less food went in the trash can. The reason it didn't work is because the hairnet union was going <laughs> to lose a bunch of workers. The ladies in the hairnet in the back that cook the peas for a week, they're losing a job because now less people are needed to prepare the fried food and more of it's fresh. And so the school district was said, nope, not going to do it because the hairnet union basically put up a fight. So it's complicated. And it's usually about money, but I'd say the missing ingredient in most cases is the kids aren't involved at all in choosing. If you gave them five choices of healthy fruits and vegetables, five choices of healthy salad dressings or whatever, and made it kid size. So in an elementary school, you know, make kid size salad bars, kid size choice bars, make little mini bran muffins, make little, you know, things that are kid friendly and healthy and have them involved in the decision making. It's just like the work sites. 
people feel like they're involved. They want to they wanna do that. If somebody's coming in and say, ah, we, do, we had a special on rutabaga this week, eat it. Um, you know, I don't think it's, they're not used to it. So I think there has to be more involvement of the, of the kids themselves. Does the food industry have the capacity for the nutritional school lunches? I know they backed off of the whole grains, so do they have the capacity for it? I don't know the answer to that question. I think they have the capacity to do more than what's going on now, but, and I think just like anything, as, as the marketplace demand evolves and the food industry will follow, the food industry doesn't create the demand to, for the most part. I mean, yes, you say, well, they created a new type of lucky charm that didn't exist, and so why did nobody said I needed a new type of lucky charm? But they're really playing on your latent desires. You know, so another lucky charm is, wow, just as tasty as the first one. Anything else? Well, going back to, to the worksite wellness, I'm interested, because you said that that one place had 22 different sites, and uh -huh. I think how much of a difference there is between the companies you work with where it's been one place, one smaller group, and a much bigger network of offices or bigger corporation and efficiency. Well, it's harder when you have more different places, but we let each of them kind of have their own personal touch to it. So there was, yes, there was a corporate component, but the more it could be made contextually appropriate, it's like culturally appropriate. So each one of those 22 businesses had its own little mini culture. You know, so a business in Seattle is fundamentally different than a business in Virginia in terms of just the people that are there because they're there for whatever reason. Um, so we try to work, as I said, individually to make sure that it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's very much custom. Do you plan on ever releasing the results from these, or is it always going to be a contractual? Uh, the short answer is yes, we plan on it. Uh, when, I can't tell you exactly, partly because none of these businesses want their data to be shared. And I keep telling them, but somebody has to start the tipping point. They have to start to put out, here's what we did and here's how it worked. Isn't this wonderful? So that others will try it. Because everybody's kind of looking around going, well, oh, I don't want to go first. You know, show me something that's worked. And then, and then I'll try it. So we're working on it. I, I have kind of a dated question. Um, I did a story a couple weeks ago that looked more historically at the obesity epidemic and suggested that the timeline moves back a little bit further than what you're talking about, the 50s, the 60s, 70s. Um, that even since the turn of the 1900s, in, in the early 1900s, even though the data is unreliable, that BMI was starting to go up even then. Um, <coughs> and that that's not a function of necessarily a, a modern office culture uh, society, that that's something that's just kind of been happening for a lot longer than we say. Well, industrialization, urbanization, transportation, transformation, I, all those things have started to change the way we live our lives from the beginning. So the industrialization then led to the industrialization of the food supply. So obviously when cars came, came upon us, um, it really transformed the way people got around in large part. Urbanization means, means there's fewer people doing farming, and so they're less involved with the food supply. They're, you know, they become more sedentary just because the, the space is more limited. Even though they are walking to work, it's not walking five miles to the, you know, to the next ranch down. So I don't know. I mean, that's speculation. I can only say that I think these changes have taken a long time to get to this point. But literally, we're now splitting hairs. Like, how much more energy can we take out of your life, and how much more food can we possibly provide <laughs> than what we've got now? Um, a, a question about when when you talk to um, these companies and businesses, um, do you do you talk to them about their um, the ethnic makeup of their workforce? And the reason I ask that is because you know we're talking about the different cultural differences and how we celebrate, and a lot of different cultures celebrate with um, a lot of food. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if that's part of your research. So that when you do talk to a company, say, you know, um, depending on what their ethnic makeup of the workforce is, there are different approaches to how you get them to, to have a healthier lifestyle. It's, it's a good point. We haven't run into a business yet that's ethnically 
that diverse yet. So I think um, I think the toughest ones that we talk to are ones that are more either manufacturing or like trucking. Those kinds of businesses where it's not an ethnic diversity, it's more of a, it's such a specialized type of, of work that has certain work almost like context demands, like you can't drive a truck standing up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. At least not yet. So those are tough, really tough. And if you're, you know, number 15 on the line and you put this bolt in this part, you know, that's, again, a challenge. And even the hospitals here where they have shift work, it grinds people up, you know, 12-hour shifts. It's like, okay, but better life would be not so long the shifts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh, don't go there because that's about money. So I think it does require really customizing it to that audience, whether it be an ethnic difference audience or um, a work type audience. And what about, um, do you look at socioeconomics, like um, trying to convince people who don't have a high income or, or upper middle class, um, you know, the stereotype is those healthy foods are just too expensive. Well, that's part of what education can do is to say it doesn't have to be that expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the trade-off there is, yes, it takes time to prepare. And so, you know, if you do time studies of people, it's like everybody has time they could devote to something else. Now, the question is, what are they giving up if they don't watch four hours of TV and they only watch three hours of TV and they cook the other hour? Um, you know, I think that's what, if you change the stress in the workplace, then maybe they won't feel so badly about taking another hour out of their television time to spend preparing food. Most people just say, look, I, I don't watch TV, I, I just stare at it. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> it's like plugging in the recharger, not doing anything really. <laughs> so anyway, tough questions, but all good ones. Anybody else? Okay. Well, we've got 20 minutes. First of all, thank you, Dr. Peters. <laughs>